To rage or not to rage? That's the question that the protagonist of Berserk often finds himself stuck on when it comes to a fight. But this video isn't about guts, it's about two dudes who pretty much embody the concept of being the eye of the storm. Even as hell rages on around them, Griffith and Skull Knight are, more often than not, standing on business without even breaking a sweat. There are many similarities between the foe of the Inhumans and the Inhuman King, which begs the question, will we ever see them have an honest to god fight? in Berserk. Many of you might say that they already have, and that may be true, but the question goes deeper than a failed assassination attempt, and you know that as well. So in this video, we're gonna take a look at something nobody asked for, but we're sure everybody wants to know the answer to. What would happen if Skull Knight fought Griffith, and more importantly, who would win? Now, let's get on to the video. Their pasts reflect each other's closely, until they don't. Skull Knight and Griffith's Similarities Berserk is a story where many a time one person's story reflects another's, and you'll often find these people fighting on opposing sides, at least for the most part. Those of you who have seen our videos on Grunbeld Alquest will know his upbringing wasn't that far off from Serpico's. Isidro and Mule are both young warriors bedazzled by their respective idols. Sonia and Shirke are both orphan witches with powerful magic, but the people they choose to call family are fighting a war they don't know they're a part of. You get the idea. But nowhere is this kind of duality more present than in the lives of Skull Knight and Griffith, at least up until a certain point in time. In fact, it's the only one overtly alluded to in the series apart from the evident similarities between Skull Knight and his fellow struggler Guts. But what are these similarities? Well, you see, they're both men who came from nothing and aspired to be kings. Only one succeeded, and the other changed the world to achieve it. We'll elaborate on the latter half of that statement later on in the video, but let's get a bit deeper into the former. It all started in chapter 53 when Princess Charlotte began recounting the ancient history of the Kingdom of Midland. Up until this point, we'd only seen Skull Knight twice, the second time in just the last chapter where he showed up out of the blue to save Rickert's life. Apart from the fact that this guy knew nothing about Ricky and saved him anyway, and that he knew a bit too much about what was going on in Guts's life, we knew nothing about him. And then then chapter 53 gave us some context that many Berserk fans are still arguing over to this day. A thousand years before the current timeline of Berserk, the world was in chaos. It was an age of warlords, where multiple tribes, city-states, and kingdoms fought each other in endless wars for land, resources, glory, the usual stuff. But one day, a man emerged as if from nowhere and ended up unifying every tribe, nation, and kingdom into one massive empire that spanned the entire continent of man. The reason no one knew of this man's past was because it was completely undocumented. But what unfolded once he emerged is the stuff of legend, and more importantly, history. Berserk is a story where history is a lie and fairy tales are real. Much about the world's true nature has been forgotten by the people thanks to the Holy See propaganda. But there are rare moments where history and myth overlap and end up revealing the truth. Even if the characters in that conversation don't realize it, we the readers do. And this was one of those moments. Charlotte continues her history lesson by talking about how this enigmatic man, who came to be known as Supreme King Geiseric, had a loathsome reputation amongst his enemies. Apparently, this guy would fight so ruthlessly that people called him things like the King of Galloping Death, which is probably the coolest nickname ever. We'd have called our enemies something embarrassing, like Rumpus Von Pimpleskin or something, but that wasn't the case for Geiseric. Up until this point in the story, Guts thought that this guy sounded a lot like Griffith, and we can't deny that assessment. We tend to think we know a lot about Griffith, but when you really think about it, what do we really know about him? Nothing, before he started the Band of the Falcon, right? Same thing with King Geiseric back in the day. No one knows which city it was where Griffith spent his childhood and acquired his lifelong dream. All we know is it was a city with a castle, and Griffith wanted that castle. We know he's an orphan because of his own personal musings, not because people are aware of that fact. And when you think about his appearance on the world stage, it's almost identical to the way Geiseric came to power. The Band of the Falcon was relatively unknown before their exploits under the Tudor General Genin. Once Griffith broke off from them and joined the Kingdom of Midland, his undefeated battle record became legendary, and was cemented in history when he recaptured the infallible fortress of Doldry. He is the only commoner in the kingdom's long past to rise to the position of general, 
and as far as the people are concerned, he's their savior from the terrible Hundred Years War. And though this was only known by his inner circle, Griffith had machinations to become the king as well, which involved the very princess giving Guts and Co. a history lesson in the middle of a rescue mission. Perhaps that's why Guts compared Geiserk's tale to Griffith's, especially given that he was such a crucial part of the latter. However, Guts made this assumption before hearing of Geiserk's exploits in the field, which is what changes everything. Charlotte goes on to state that though Geiserk's epithets were derived from his actions in battle, a big reason behind their staying power was his choice of attire, because whenever Geiserk stepped into battle, he would don a war helm shaped like a skull. This immediately makes Guts think of Skull Knight, and then Judo cuts off Charlotte by recounting a folk tale that sounds just like her lesson. Called The Fairy Tale of the Skull King, it documents the downfall of Geiserk's empire at the hands of God's angels, after the supreme ruler's hubris broke through a critical point. There is some confusion as to how many angels God sent to punish Geiseric, whether it was four or five, but what is known is that his city disappeared overnight through natural disasters, and no one's heard of it since. Charlotte reveals that Geiseric's city still sleeps underneath the Tower of Rebirth, which is confirmed by the ending of Chapter 53, which shows us several classical structures in decay and disrepair, and mounds of corpses seared with the brand of sacrifice. This is why we say that where myth and history intersect, you'll find truth, and why we said that Geiseric and Griffith's past were similar to each other's until they weren't. While Geiseric went on to become king and lose his kingdom to the God Hand, Griffith became a God Hand member to conquer his kingdom. He tried to do it as a human, but failed, because his own hubris got in the way of rational thinking and ended up making him commit treason. In many ways, Skull Knight and Femto are reflections of the road not taken for Griffith and Geiseric respectively. Skull Knight is what Griffith could have ended up as had he had noble intentions, and Femto is what Geiseric could have become had his heart been given over to the power of evil. This is why whenever we see Skull Knight talking about Griffith in the series, he often refers to him in reflective terms. The first time he met Guts, Skull Knight called Griffith his unkingly half, which sounded like a casual diss at the time, but revealed itself to be a much larger critique of Griffith's overall persona in the long run. In Chapter 362, after Guts lived through a blood memory bestowed upon him by the Berserker armor, he realized that Skull Knight was more like himself than Griffith. SK was the previous owner of the armor, which explains Geiseric's demonic reputation and most other things, honestly, but that isn't the important part. The important part is that this chapter confirmed to us that while Geiseric's life had the trappings of Griffith's story, his actual lived experience was far closer to Guts's. His ambition might have made him a king, but his fate was to be a struggler against the tide of causality, something Griffith chose to embrace instead. Like Guts, Skull Knight had a woman he'd lost to the workings of the God Hand, but unlike him, he wasn't able to save her, and in the end, he didn't even think of himself as the great unifier of all mankind, because as soon as the blood memory was over, Skull Knight told Guts he had just witnessed the end of a foolish king and the birth of a wandering wraith that stalks the endless night. The choices these two men with boundless ambition made in their human lives is what led them down the paths they have taken, and it's at one of the many temporal crossroads of this millennium-long journey that their roads first converged. Skull Knight vs. Griffith, Round 1, The Birth of a New God if you guys have been keeping up with our Berserk breakdowns, y'all know what's about to happen. We're going to methodically break down each encounter between these characters, and this must be your lucky day or our worst day ever, because there are only two major instances to speak of in this video. But in classic Miura fashion, they tell us a lot about a potential third. The first time Skull Knight faces off against Griffith in his new existential form as a god hand is during the Eclipse. Before this, Skull Knight was only aware of Griffith's status as a chosen one. Makes sense, considering he's been keeping tabs on the God Hand for a millennium, but still, stalker alert if you ask us. Jokes aside though, this encounter isn't an accurate representation of what you can expect from a proper showdown between these two, simply because Griffith, sorry, Femto, had just been born. The Eclipse is a harrowing ordeal, not just for those who are sacrificed during it, but also for the person doing the sacrificing, because it's a literal rebirth ceremony. When Griffith accepted the God Hand's offer to join them, and finally got the power to make his dreams come true, he also forfeited his human existence. As a God Hand member, Femto is a completely new entity, a profound astral deity that can only materialize in the spirit world. And because his introduction to the spirit world is so recent, Femto doesn't exactly know his own powers yet, which makes his first encounter with Skull Knight a bit of a disappointment. After breaking into the Eclipse and taking a pot shot at Void, Skull Knight immediately makes for Guts and Casca. He dispatches dozens of apostles with disgusting ease on his way, and Femto tries to stop him, 
but he misses. See, Femto isn't quite aware of his spatial powers yet, what with being a newborn babe and all, so he doesn't exactly know how far his abilities go. He knows he has instinctive control over apostles because he uses that control to help him pin down the victims of his greatest crime. But he isn't aware that he can manipulate space itself and bend it to his will, which ends up turning multiple apostles into unfortunate casualties. The reason for Femto missing his attacks is also Skull Knight's immense speed. The Wandering Wraith is one of the fastest characters in the entire series, able to get in and out of the Eclipse within seconds. When Femto aimed his spatial powers at Skull Knight, he moved out of the way, grabbed his targets, and got the hell out of there before the God Hand member could try again. No physical blows were exchanged during this encounter, though it was likely possible given both Femto and Skull Knight are astral beings. But you can consider round one a net win for SK, considering Femto couldn't even use his powers right. But as you might have picked up on, this was only because he was practically an infant at that point in the story. By the next time we see him, canonically speaking, Femto's control over his spatial powers has been refined considerably. During the Black Swordsman arc, he is able to effortlessly thrash about guts without so much as lifting a finger. And he even managed to tank cannon fire aimed directly at his goddamn face with a wall of unseen space. He could even interpret the flow of causality far more clearly now, considering he'd spent two years as a God Hand member. And Femto inherited Griffith's driven nature, which meant that his understanding of himself and his own abilities had grown exponentially by the time he and Skull Knight met again. Skull Knight vs. Griffith, Round 2, The Birth of a New World the next time Skull Knight and Griffith faced off against each other was right at the cusp of the new world being born, and you could tell immediately that things were very different this time around. For Skull Knight, not much had changed in terms of his powers or abilities, except for one crucial addition to his arsenal. After ingesting and processing behelots within his own body for several years, Skull Knight was able to create a weapon capable of trapping the God Hand within the Abyss itself, the Sword of Actuation. You can find out more about how this sword actually works in our dedicated video to the blade on our channel, but the gist of it is, with this sword, Skull Knight can now cut through space as well, and use it to trap his targets within the Vortex of Souls. He specifically created this sword to counter the God Hand and their advents, which he proved in Clip Off, where he cleaned up the chaos caused by Slan's advent using his Sword of Actuation. Now that he can appear anywhere, anytime he wants to, and send whoever he wants directly to the Abyss, the threat posed to him by the God Hand should be enormous, right? Well, this is where things go left for the foe of the Inhumans, for as ingenious as his solution is, it is just as ineffective in front of an entity that can see the future as ice cream is for treating a cold. In the time between his ascension and his incarnation, Femto grasped his essence as an immortal-ish being. So, when he returned to the physical world as Griffith once again, his powers were absolute. As the Falcon of Light, Griffith has performed feats that can only be called miracles. He can effortlessly dodge or phase through arrows, pick your pick, and can fly to his targets directly on the back battlefield. His spatial powers have increased to the point he can literally summon the wind with them. And as for his foresight, that's where Skull Knight and Femto's second encounter comes into play. After putting on one dazzling Christ-like display after another for his blind white sheep and obedient black sheep, Griffith decides to handle the Ganeshka problem himself, and flies up to the Dread Emperor's transformed head with no backup but Zod and an unsuspecting Rakshas. Once he reaches there, Griffith transforms into his release state as Femto, and promises to deliver the tormented Shiva from itself. Before he can do this, he's attacked by Skull Knight, who uses the Sword of Actuation to cut through space and ambush the God Hand member. This strategy would likely have worked had Skull Knight picked any day other than the day of the final battle between Griffith and Ganeshka. You see, Skull Knight has an established pattern of going after the God Hand on major temporal junctions. He did it at the Eclipse, he did it before and during the Incarnation Ceremony, he was there to defend Flora before her spirit tree was burned to a crisp, and he was even present on Elfhelm shortly before its collapse. The moment of Ganeshka's death was foretold as a major turning point in the series by none other than Sonya herself, who claimed that with it would come the New World. This made the final battle between Griffith and Ganeshka a major temporal junction, which made Skull Knight's appearance sort of predictable. On top of that, there is also the fact that Griffith was already expecting this to happen, because of what appears to be causal awareness. When Skull Knight ambushes Femto, he immediately tries to hit him with a one-way express ticket to hell, but this time Femto is fast enough to intercept his attack with his own spatial powers. To put into context how quickly this all happened, it took Nosferatu Zod, one of the strongest and most alert apostles 
apostles in Griffith's army a good second to realize his master was in deep trouble. But it wasn't just Femto's increased response time or improved spatial manipulation that allowed him to survive that spatial sword stroke, it was also causality. When Femto intercepts and molds the Skull Knight's spatial attack into a weapon of his own, he says that the body of one twice reincarnated and a sword stroke that reaches deeper still into the spirit world have opened the door. Femto then kills Ganeshka in his Shiva form with the sword stroke and triggers the great roar of the astral world, which puts the entire planet into one giant interstice. This is what we meant by Griffith basically uno-reversing Geyseric's playbook to acquire his own kingdom. When Geyseric was king, the physical and astral worlds already overlapped with one another, and he used the powers of the Berserker armor and his mage friends from Elfhelm to establish a global empire. He then lost it all thanks to his hubris and sage void, and the world ended up forgetting about its own magnificence over the next millennium. Griffith re-established that overlapping status quo specifically to exploit it and gain his kingdom, because being a God Hand member, he has immense influence over what goes on in the astral world. And now that it was merged with the physical world, his power, as we said earlier, was absolute. This includes his near prescient awareness of the causal current, which is likely what told him exactly what would happen when Skull Knight attacked him. So while well, round one was a net win for Skull Knight because he hit his targets against what was essentially an infant, round two was a resounding failure. Not only did he not land a single hit on Griffith, much like Guts, he also ended up making things much worse for everybody. Maybe that's why he hasn't brought up the fact that he messed up and caused the great roar of the astral world to any of his allies yet. But eventually, that dam will have to break. Because as things stand right now, all the ducks on either side of this epic are lining up in a row, and those rows are headed to the east. At the conclusion of the Fantasia arc, Griffith sets his sights upon the east as his next objective, and in the last chapter of Berserk, chapter 375, guess where Guts' party ends up being taken? That's right, the Kushan lands, which lie in the east. So, if the entire Eastern Exile arc of Berserk is going to be on a resource consolidation consolidation before final battle type beat, it's worth taking a look at how two of its key instruments are going to end up interacting with each other. Skull Knight vs Griffith, Round 3, The End of the Worlds They've Known and Will Know. Throughout this video, we've made it a point to stress how Skull Knight and Griffith are two sides of the same coin, and how they'd have ended up the same way had they made similar choices in life. But they didn't, which is why they are where they are now and where that is, is on opposing sides of fate itself. We know that causality, the concept of fate in Berserk, has a cause and effect relationship with the world it governs. Whatever yarns it spins within the abyss affect the world, and whatever happens in the world affects its yarn spinning. Skull Knight has always fought against the tide of causality, and Griffith is rushing through fulfilling causal checkpoints like he's trying to keep himself from drowning. You could even say they're fated to clash with each other during the final battle of Berserk, but what would that even look like? Well, if you've seen our video on Skull Knight vs. Void, which you quite frankly should, it's brilliant, you'll know what our opinion is when Skull Knight and his sort of actuation go up against the God Hand. Unless, and until he can find a way to counter the causal awareness, there's no chance Skull Knight can beat any of the God Hand, and he's already been trying to do that for years and years and years. Then, you add their space-time bending powers on top of it, and things start looking pretty hopeless for Skull Knight. For example, Void could easily counter Skull Knight's sort of actuation with his own portals. And as for Griffith, he's already shown he's at a level where he can manipulate tears within the fabric of reality however he damn well pleases. No, the sort of actuation angle isn't what will give Skull Knight an edge against his demonic adversaries, if that's the way the story flows. Instead, it'll be something he himself stated rather offhandedly, which is ironic considering he's the harbinger of doom of everyone else. Skull Knight once told Guts that Griffith, post-incarnation, was like an author writing his own life story in real time. He he had complete control over everyone and everything within his story, and so the only ones that could affect him are the ones outside of his story. Griffith has carefully planted subconscious hints within the minds of all mankind that he is their blessed falcon of light, fated to save them from the evils of the world. He has used the desperation people harbor in their hearts, and exploited the image of God to gain control over the fates of many in the series. But you know who he doesn't control yet? The main guys of our story, and they haven't even noticed it yet. When Skull Knight was was warning Guts of the incarnation ceremony, he referenced the prophetic dream of the Falcon that was covered in chapters 126 through 128. But Guts thought back to the warning the demon child gave him about Casca, not a vision about some god he didn't believe in. The same was the case with Farnese. For a woman that used to be a fanatical believer in the Holy See, it was beyond 
curious that Farnese didn't get the Falcon Dream, even as she was with the Holy Iron Chain Knights. Rickard, a man who had made peace with his former life as a Falcon and found new purpose in life with Erica, is the only guy to have laid hands on Griffith since his incarnation. So, in a way, if Skull Knight was to step outside of Griffith's story, he should be able to harm him. And to be honest, he's already halfway there. Skull Knight has referred to Griffith with the lens of a soul that sees itself reflected in another, but he ultimately doesn't care about him. His main target is Void. It's always been Void, and maybe if he becomes aware of this and takes himself out of the Griffith Guts equation, he could conversely end up harming Griffith with his ever-trusty sword. Skull Knight has been chopping up apostles for decades, so you don't need to worry about his regular sword not working on the God Hand. If anything, Dragon Slayer is a knockoff of SK's sword in terms of its effectiveness against astral creatures. But the point here is, the only way we can see Skull Knight getting a definitive W over Griffith is by breaking out of the causal current and doing something completely unexpected. And what that could be is hard to predict, given the nature of Berserk's storytelling and current release schedule. If Skull Knight were to reorganize his priorities and focus on just Void as being the climax to his story, then the Sword of Actuation could perhaps end up working the way it was intended to. But if all that turns out to be wishful thinking, then Griffith absolutely wipes the floor with the guy. Unless he can figure out a way to break Griffith's connection to the physical world and find a weakness in his seemingly all-powerful existence, he has no chance of ever seeing his revenge quest through. And that would make his entire existence as a wraith pointless, which would be a fitting character arc ending given that this is Berserk. Marvelous Verdict! But what isn't fitting is the way we're gonna have to end this video because I'm afraid that's all we've got for you guys. Skull Knight has literally been there and done that when it comes to Griffith's lifelong ambition, which is why everything the Falcon does rings so hollow to us. Every move Griffith makes is geared to profit no one but himself, even his most benevolent actions. He protected Casca from a rape, only to exploit her skills as a survivor and then expect her to bow to his needs when he himself became helpless. He acquired Guts as a soldier, treated him like a friend, and then denied it all because it would mean giving the guy equal status. Sure, Griffith was tortured and Geiseric was a torturer, at least according to Mosgus' story, but what conclusions do we draw when the former turns out more messed up than the latter in the grand scheme of things? Skull Knight vs. Griffith is the ultimate battle of what-if scenarios in Berserk, which is why we low-key want them to have the final fight and not Guts and Griffith. But that's just our take on all of this. What do you guys think? Let us know in the comments section down below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more beautiful Berserk content, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Until then, keep on struggling, strugglers.